Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. Clients or no? Today we have a story with an interesting plot. Enjoy the show! Have you ever had a vague gut feeling that something is wrong, but you just couldn't figure out what the problem was? Well, I recently started having this feeling, and it's starting to drive me crazy. I have a sneaking suspicion that Amy, my wife of seven years, is cheating on me. Tom Matson, I talked to her about our relationship, and she warmly assured me that everything was just fine between us. I even went so far as to hire my cousin, who was unemployed at the time, to shadow her for a couple of weeks. I sat him in the rental car and handed him a high-quality video camera so he could record anything that seemed suspicious to him. The cousin did a meticulous job of following her around and carefully videotaping her as she went about her daily activities. But throughout his observation, he was unable to detect any questionable activities by her. My job as a senior project manager at a large bank requires me to be in the office all day long. I don't travel often and never work on weekends. I also rarely have to work late at the bank, so Amy could never complain about me being away from home too often. For a young 29-year-old guy, I make pretty good money, so we live in a comfortable house and drive nice cars. Amy and I don't have children yet, but we lead quite active lives. We hang out with several different groups of friends, including neighbors, my work colleagues, and our old school friends. We also both enjoy riding bikes, so we sometimes meet up with a few other couples who are members of our club. In short, my wife and I look like the perfect couple from a storybook. Taking all this into account, I racked my brain for a long time trying to come up with a reason why Amy could be cheating on me but failed without finding any clues. Both of us agreed that we wanted to wait to try to have children until she was 30 because we wanted to be a financially secure couple by then. Besides, we both wanted to have fun, enjoy life, and enjoy each other before spending 20 to 25 years raising children. Amy is about six months younger than me and works as a dog groomer. Her fine arts degree didn't do much for her in the job market when she was trying to find a job in that field, so I suggested she just start her own business doing what she liked best. Well, she loves dogs, we have two at home. So we bought a custom trailer that she hooked up to her SUV, and voila, Amy took up traveling dog care. She soon had dozens of regular clients, and she visited each of them at home about once a month to care for their pets. Her heated trailer has hot water, a vacuum system, a hairdryer, air conditioning, and everything else she might need to care for her dogs. Like our home, some of her clients have a dedicated pet washing slash grooming annex next to the garage, so sometimes she uses that instead of her trailer. Amy has a small handheld terminal that allows her to accept credit cards to pay for her services, but she seems to receive most of her money in cash. I know this because I helped her with her bookkeeping and tax forms. So what made me think she was cheating on me? Damn it if I knew. We have always had and still have a great intimate life. Amy is willing to do just about anything my twisted mind can think of in bed, and for my part, I can't remember ever saying no to anything she asked me to do. We are both home almost every evening and weekend. We always communicate well, ride bikes together, and go to the gym together. So when and where could she cheat on me? The only time we really spend apart is during the hours we work, which is why I hired my cousin to watch her for two weeks. He really surprised me by providing a complete and detailed account of her activities, including exact times, locations, and videos of her arriving and leaving each meeting in where she was in between calls. No matter how you look at the report, there were no illogical failures or inexplicable discrepancies in time. All her time in the field was fully documented. I even cross-referenced the receipts she received with her appointment calendar, and they all appeared to be correctly formatted and consistent with her appointments. And yet still, something felt almost imperceptible, something in her eyes, in her smile, in her voice, was simply not the same as before, and this went on for about six months. I couldn't just stand in front of her, directly announce my doubts to her face, and accuse her of anything because, yeah, simply because I had nothing to blame her for. Damn, maybe I'm being paranoid or going crazy. I watched her when we went out with friends, but mostly she hung out with other ladies. I've never seen her sneaking whispers to another guy. She never disappeared anywhere at parties, nor did she retire with anyone for an hour to chat tete-a-tete -tete over a glass of beer or a cocktail. I tried to observe my wife as discreetly and cautiously as possible, but Brad, 
one of my old and bosom friends, nevertheless noticed something unusual in my behavior at the last big party. Tom, dude, you have to let go of her leash. It seems like you won't let this poor girl get more than 20 feet away from you. What's going on, buddy? Embarrassed that my secret intentions were so transparent to prime eyes, I shushed him and asked him to keep his voice down. Brad, I. I have a feeling she might be playing on the side, if you know what I mean, so well, I tried to keep my eyes on her. Brad seemed simply amazed at my suspicions. Is this a joke or are you kidding me right? Amy? Do you think Amy is cheating on you? He raised his eyebrows and snorted as if I had blurted out some of the most utter nonsense in the world. Huh, you're just crazy, dude. No way Amy would get mixed up with anyone at this party. How do you know? How can you be so sure she's not having a night with one of these? Get over yourself, dude. About half the guys here were hitting on her because she's so hot. Sorry, buddy, but it's a fact. He spread his hands playfully. I mean, look at Amy, slim, toned, with great chest, a great fifth place, great legs, a beautiful face, and a smile that lights up the whole room. Damn it, you're just incredibly lucky. Brad clicked his tongue in admiration and lightly punched me in the shoulder. Okay, now look, he continued, all these guys hovered around like bees over a flower and stuck to her. But which of them was lucky? And none of us. He made a somewhat deliberate, pitifully upset grimace. Yes, I said us because I myself pestered her at every opportunity. But then he raised his index finger up and shook it a little drunkenly in front of my face. She never did anything other than laugh in my face. Other guys, they said the same thing. She always turns everything into a joke and even mockingly makes fun of all our tricks. God, what I wouldn't give to be in your place for at least one night, he muttered, staring at the animated chattering in the female company of Amy with poorly concealed lust. His words seemed to calm my suspicions, but I didn't really like the looks he was throwing at my wife. I frowned, oh my god, Brad, do I have to kick your fifth place to keep you away from my wife? That's exactly what I'm talking to you about, you fool. You don't have to do this at all because for all of us, she is the untouchable lady. Believe me, as a friend, this is exactly the case, he patted me on the shoulder. Well, that's what you say, I drawled, rubbing my chin in thought. You may be right, but something is happening. I just know it. Listen, Tom, he said decisively, I love you like a brother, but if you screw up and piss her off with your stupid suspicions so much that she leaves your jealous fifth place, then I will be the first to step on your stupid head when I run to her doors to get ahead of the crowd of all those candidates. I waved my hand, almost convinced by his heated speech. Okay, 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 you're right. I was being stupid. It's just, I love her with all my heart, and I don't want to lose her. Please, Brad, don't say anything about this to anyone, and I'll try to put it all out of my mind. Brad laughed and patted me on the back. That's great. Just go home and treat her right, or I'll knock on your door. This conversation of ours became the first alarm bell for me, which, however, seemed to be a false signal. The party ended, and I took Amy home, and we had some hot night. As I lay in bed and calmed my breathing, I replayed the conversation with Brad in my head and finally decided that I was simply wasting my energy and driving myself crazy for no rational reason. All my investigations showed absolutely nothing, while Amy continued to treat me like a king and the only man in her life. I drew a line under the doubts and thoughts and told myself that I was tired of playing amateur detective and I needed to finally start trusting my wife. When Amy arrived at Brad's house for his daughter's monthly grooming, she immediately noticed that he was nervous. What's the matter, Brad? She asked. What's on your mind? You seem preoccupied with something. How has Tom been lately after that party? He answered the question with a question. Is he still acting strange? No, it's only been a few days, but he seems okay. At our house, everything is as usual. Why are you suddenly asking about Tom? She could not understand the purpose of his question. I saw him keep his eyes on you at the last party. I, um, he hesitated a little, I had a little too much to drink then, and well, I let slip a little because he seemed to be spying on you. What? Are you serious, idiot? Now he'll make his thick-headed cousin watch you, Amy clasped her hands and seemed seriously angry. No, don't worry, 
Everything is fine, Brad said in a calming voice, putting his hands forward. I pretended to be worried that he was starting to go crazy with his suspicions. In general, I did everything as you and I agreed. I told Tom that the boys and I kept hitting on you, but you always kicked us off, so I convinced him that there was absolutely nothing to worry about. I think he believed his best friend. Brad grinned. What's all this crap about his cousin? I told you I've seen him four times in the last couple of weeks, although I've never noticed him in town before. Frowning and biting her lower lip, Amy thought, mechanically twirling a lock of hair around her finger. You know, she said hesitantly, maybe I'm kind of paranoid, but it seems to me that this cousin of his may have been following me. This is weird. I know your husband suspected something was going on, but he couldn't figure out what it was. Did Tom tell you anything about this? No, he hasn't brought this up again since the last time he asked me if we were okay. Damn, this really upsets me, Amy rubbed her temples dejectedly. I love him, but I'm afraid he would never accept this idea, so he must not find out what we did. I agree, Tom is a good guy. If he somehow found out about our arrangement, yes, it would cause him great pain, Amy nodded her head, and said, well, okay, well, I have about an hour left. You want, as usual? Yes, baby. Brad boomed enthusiastically, starting to hastily take off his clothes. As always, doll, I love it so much. As usual, I need 200 bucks in cash, and I'll charge your card another $75 for services for Buster, Amy said, following Brad into the bedroom. That day, Brad was a little more energetic and quick than usual, so afterward, they just lay in bed, hugging each other and talking. Brad, you're going to have to tell the other guys to be careful and hold their tongues and not say anything stupid in front of Tom. I admit we all had a lot of fun, Amy stroked Brad's thigh with a satisfied smile, and you guys have been very generous to me, but in a couple of months, I'm going to stop my little side business. Hey, wait, why the hell do you suddenly want to stop everything? Frowning his eyebrows, Brad jumped up from the pillow and sat up on the bed. I've almost reached my goal of $122,000, which I will need to pay for my husband and my surprise trip to Hawaii. I hope that Tom will make me pregnant while we enjoy our vacation. During this trip, Amy said, smiling dreamily, stroking her stomach and circling her finger around her navel, I'd have to go off birth control to do this, of course. So I'm sorry but I can't risk one of you accidentally becoming a father, Amy said with a chuckle. However, Brad did not share her good-natured and playful mood. The news he heard from Amy was reflected on his face as if he had chewed a whole sour lemon. Damn, Amy, you're making me so upset. I couldn't even imagine that it would ever end so suddenly. The guys and I are paying you great money for your beautiful fifth place. You know that our prime wives never allow us to do such things. With his pleading voice, the lover tried to pity her and persuade her to change her decision. Brad then leaned forward and tried to kiss Amy, recoiling sharply. Amy jerked her head to the side. Hey, what the hell are you doing, Brad? We've said it before, no romance, it's just business. You all pay money for a specific act and nothing more. Please don't make me tell you this again, she exclaimed angrily. Brad pouted, but then raised his hands in repentance. Okay. Okay, forgive me. You're just so beautiful that sometimes I get carried away and can't control myself. Amy grinned and patted his cheek. I know that, honey. I like all of you guys, and I really enjoy spending time together. But this is not love. This is just business. Nothing more. Amy stretched sweetly and then jumped out of bed, picking up her scattered clothes. Okay, I need to give Buster a quick shampoo before I leave, and you need to get back to work. My appointments are scheduled for another four weeks from today, but today was the last time we did this, she concluded, pointing to the bed. Oh, I really will miss this, Brad sighed sadly and hung his head, but literally after a few seconds, he perked up, and his eyes lit up with an idea that came to his mind, okay, well, how about we continue doing fitness after you get pregnant? Amy laughed, well, that's unlikely. After my trip to Hawaii, I plan to quit the business of renting out my fifth place forever. Well, just think about it, okay? As for me, it would be quite hot and so exciting. He reached out from the bed and lovingly stroked Amy's tight high fifth place and then gave her a loud spank. I bet the other guys would want to try it too. Heck, we might even pay extra. 
Amy laughed again as she poured water for Buster's bath. It sounds tempting, but I don't want to take that risk anymore. I love Tom, but he doesn't think like me, she sighed. Intim for him is always associated only with love. He will never understand or accept our business agreement, and neither will any of your wives, by the way. Yes, I agree with you. Millie and the other wives would be furious if they knew about it. While Amy was shampooing the dog, she remembered her first time with Brad. He pestered her every time she came to look after his dog. He always made unambiguous hints and seized moments to accidentally touch or rub against her. Finally, she got tired of it, and Amy demanded that he behave himself. She said that if she didn't need the money so much, she would have dumped him as a client. At that moment, Brad immediately saw an opportunity in her words and offered her a big extra cash tip if she would let him rub up against her and feel her. Amy thought about his offer for a moment, but then decided that such a small concession on her part would allow her to quickly achieve her goal of saving money for a vacation, so she agreed. Pretty soon, Brad was begging to have Intim from the back door, continuing to offer her more and more money for consent. When he once offered her $1,000 in cash, she didn't believe him and mockingly called his offer a bluff. Amy realized that she had been too hasty with her ill-advised sarcasm when, 20 minutes later, a stack of bills with the faces of American presidents lay on the table, an intimate took place. True, her financial goal has become a little closer. On his next visit, he only gave her $500 for another service, and then he decided that $200 is enough for each subsequent time. After some persuasion, she agreed to this price once a month. Brad played poker with his friends Tim, Frank, and Roland, not too often, but when the opportunity arose, Tom joined them. Table talk during the game was often about intimate, and usually included the usual male whining about how their prudish wives had no imagination, no passion, and didn't want to do anything in bed other than lie like a log in the missionary position. On one of these nights when Tom was not in their company, a slightly tipsy Brad hinted to his friends that he had finally managed to get a juicy female at his complete disposal. Of course, all the guys immediately attacked him, demanding to know all the details about his luck. Then he asked them directly if they were willing to pay for the services of a married lady. That evening, they just laughed at him when he tried to convince them that he only paid $200 for the most amazing experience he had ever had. They called him an old liar who mistook his drunken fantasies for reality and advised him to sleep it off and not fool them anymore. Just a few days passed when Tim called Brad and asked if the story he told over poker was true. Then, not surprisingly, the other two called, and pretty soon after some negotiations, Amy received orders for outcall service from three more of her casual acquaintances. She met with each of them and explained what she would do and why it would only happen once a month for the next six months or so. Amy was making about $800 a month from her side business, in addition to $1,200 from the dog grooming itself. She knew that all four of her clients would keep their mouths shut because they were all married with children and none of them wanted to get divorced. At first, Amy felt some guilt for secretly deceiving Tom, but for the most part, renting out her services for a fee was just a service to her, just like her dog grooming business. She was confident in her love for Tom and was going to have children with him. She never refused a marital intim. Now, Amy had only a few weeks left to achieve her goal, and then she could easily give up unnecessary worries and focus on the birth of her child. Everything in her life went according to a well-thought-out plan. Tom was sitting at his desk, looking at some financial reports, when the screen of his personal cell phone lit up. Taking the vibrating device in his hands, he looked at the number displayed. It turned out to be his cousin Chuck. Tom wondered why his cousin needed him. Hey Chuck, hi. How can I help you? He asked, friendly, as he pressed the answer button. Hi Tom, listen, I just finished watching a movie, and something in it made me think about what you asked me to do for you a few weeks ago. Do you remember? Chuck inquired. Look Chuck, it's over now. We didn't find anything, so I got over my paranoia. Amy and I are fine now, Tom responded. Well, I'm glad to hear that everything is fine between you two. It's just after watching this movie, it occurred to me. Well, I thought that maybe I had overlooked something back then. But since you say you and Amy have moved on, okay, never mind. Just sorry for bothering you, Chuck said, about to end the call. But an alarm bell sounded in Tom's subconscious, 
telling him to be more careful and attentive to detail. He sighed loudly. Okay, Chuck, what did you see that made you think you might have missed something important? In the film, this guy formerly worked as a realtor, but in fact, under this cover, he was selling illegal substances on the side, Chuck explained. Oh my god, Chuck, Amy does not sell illegal substances. Yes, I know. Don't get excited, just listen. That guy in the movie went to the house to show it to a potential buyer. Well, his so-called buyer came there, but instead of inspecting and buying a house, he bought illegal substances. The cops, who were tailing them, sat in ambush outside while this fake realtor was inside the house for sale, selling illegal substances and pretending to actually sell the house, Tom exclaimed. I don't understand anything. What does this have to do with illegal substances, cops, and by the way, Amy is never a realtor. Tom was puzzled. Look Chuck, I need to get back to work. Damn, bro, you're so tight, Tom replied, feeling stressed. I know she's not a realtor, but she goes into people's houses and stays there for an hour or more. Sometimes she works in her trailer, but sometimes she's inside, out of sight. Well, now do you understand what I mean? How can you be sure that is what she does there, behind closed doors? Chuck pressed. Tom's thoughts were racing, his old paranoia instantly returning. Oh, look Chuck, did you take notes on which dog she worked with in her trailer and which dog she worked with in the houses? No, but the video footage of her coming and going would have shown her going into her trailer if she had used it. Do you still have these videos? Chuck asked hopefully. Hell no, I threw all that stuff away after talking to Amy. But maybe you still have a copy? Tom asked hopefully. Ah, you yourself ordered me to throw it away, and I... Well, Chuck mumbled, stuttering. Chuck, I know you always like to stare at her. So, if you kept these notes, I promise that I won't be angry with you, Tom promised. Hmm, okay then, Chuck breathed out with obvious relief. I will once again carefully review the records and summarize information about all the times Amy was detained inside houses during her trips. Can you drop by my place on your way home? Of course, I'll leave a little early and be with you at 16 Rue. Is this enough time for you to collect data and complete your investigation? Tom inquired. Yes, of course. I'm quite familiar with all this technical stuff, so I can do it pretty quickly. See you at 16, okay? Bye, Chuck replied. Oh my god, Tom thought, turning off the phone. Chuck must be watching those tapes and fantasizing about Amy. The poor guy could use a job and a new girlfriend. A few hours later, Tom and Chuck met as agreed in the latter's apartment. So Chuck began showing the notes he had made during the two weeks that he was following her. These three addresses were the only ones where Amy did her work from home. I have a video of clients meeting her in every home. The first was a little girl who answered Amy's door, followed by an old lady who I assume is her grandmother or nanny, Chuck continued. Tom nodded, seeing confirmation of Chuck's words on the videotape. He fast-forwarded the image. The second case is the guy who let her in, but then about ten minutes later, he left the house. Here, look, Chuck pointed at the screen. In these frames, you can clearly see his face as he reversed out of the driveway. I'm guessing he just leaves her there, and she then goes out the front door, which automatically latches behind her. Of course, I have no idea if anyone else was in the house. But Tom, you can see that no one escorted her, and she closed the front door herself. Yes, everything is logical and natural, Tom agreed, rubbing his forehead and carefully peering at the image on the screen. As long as there is nothing suspicious on her part. Well, what did you find out at the third address? And here, we have something interesting, Chuck perked up. Look, in the third house, the guy lets her in, and then about an hour later, wait, I'll rewind. Now, there, see this dude leaving? After which, Amy also leaves through the front door. After about half an hour, Chuck stopped the recording and turned around, seeing that Tom, spellbound, was silently looking at the screen and a still frame of his wife leaving the house. He waited for Tom to say something, but Tom just continued to stare blankly at the screen. Well, cousin, what do you say? Hey, Tom, are you okay? Alarmed, Chuck waved his palm in front of his brother's petrified face. 
He finally shuddered, slowly turned his gaze to his cousin, and blinked distantly a couple of times. He recognized this house and this big man with whom his wife had spent an hour alone without saying a word. The pale Tom reached into his pocket, pulled out his phone, and opened his calendar. It contained Amy's next work meeting scheduled for the following month. Tom looked at Chuck and pointed to the screen. In that last house, there is a master bedroom located on the first floor. Do you think you could sneak a peek inside without getting arrested for trespassing? He asked his cousin. Ah, maybe, Chuck said, with a hint of doubt in his voice. But if the curtains are drawn, I won't be able to look inside. Do you think this guy and Amy? The hint was more than transparent. Probably, Tom winced, but he's our friend, so this might all turn out to be a complete. Although he's always admitted that he's not indifferent to her, so maybe, holy. I'm going to go so crazy. Tom shouted, boiling, and slammed his fist on the table next to him. Chuck did not try to interfere with his opinion and advice. While Tom, with his clenched fists in front of him, sat at the table with his head down, finally, he collected his thoughts and looked at his cousin again. She should return there tomorrow. What would you say if I asked you to follow her and then try to look inside and find out what's going on there? Tom looked searchingly at Chuck, tensely waiting for his decision. Yes, of course, I will do it for you, brother. But what if they're doing something you suspect they're doing somewhere other than the master bedroom? Chuck asked. Damn, it's possible, Tom thought for a moment, then waved his hand. Okay, then, just do what you can and try not to get caught. Amy might recognize you, and then she'll know for sure that I sent you. Okay? You're right this time. I'll dress to disguise myself and use my mother's minivan instead of my car. Plus... Now we know where Amy's going and what time she'll be there, so I don't have to follow her everywhere. I'll wait for her there. Sorry, but I'm not very good at spying on cars, and it's possible that she saw me that last time, Chuck muttered apologetically. She saw you? Holy crap, Chuck, why didn't you tell me about this when it happened? Tom's eyes widened in shock. Well, I still wasn't entirely sure that she recognized me. And besides... I was afraid that you would fire me. Sorry, brother, but I really needed money then, Chuck explained. Okay, to hell with it. Let's move on. Just be careful not to get caught this time, okay? Tom asked insistently. Chuck promised to behave carefully, and the brothers soon separated. Tomorrow promised to be a very busy day for both of them. Chuck knew that Amy's visit was scheduled for 10 a.m., so at 9.30 he turned onto the street one block from Brad Street. The night before, he had scouted the area and found a suitable entrance to the neighbor's backyard through the bushes that grew along the fence on the back side of Brad's house. He parked the minivan so that he could look between the two houses and see the door opening onto Brad's backyard. Chuck assumed that Brad would let his dog outside shortly before Amy arrived. Then, as soon as she appeared, the dog would be too busy to notice him as he sneaked around the backyard. As Chuck had hoped, Brad's dog was in the yard when Amy arrived. Buster went crazy with barking, he rushed along the fence and jumped on the door. When Amy opened the patio door and let the dog in, Buster rushed towards her and began twirling and jumping around her with a cheerful bark. Chuck waited about two minutes and then, heart pounding, darted across the lawn to the back corner of the house. After catching his breath against the wall, he crept slowly to the bedroom window and swore under his breath when he saw that the blinds were drawn. Chuck knew there were two more windows on the side of the house, but he was afraid that if he moved there, he would probably be visible from the street if one of the neighbors happened to be there. While he stood pressed against the back wall of the house, not daring to lean out and with thoughts jumping around in his head like fleas on a dog, a neighbor on the far side of Brad's house let her dog out into the yard. The damn dog immediately noticed the stranger, rushed to the fence, and began barking loudly. Chuck had no choice. He walked around the corner of the house and slid along the wall to the first window. The blinds on this window were also closed, but luckily for him, not completely. Chuck positioned the camera so that through the gap in the blinds, he could see what was happening inside the bedroom and pressed record. He himself pressed his cheek against the wall of the house and froze without moving, extending his outstretched hand with the phone towards the window. He was afraid that any movement he made might give him away. 
the self-proclaimed detective was filming blindly through a window because he couldn't risk leaning over to check what his phone camera was actually recording. Just in case, he slowly and carefully moved the camera around, desperately hoping that he managed to capture the entire room. Suddenly, he heard shuffling steps nearby and a quiet conversation in the morning silence. His heart sank when he saw an elderly couple passing by along the path laid out in front of the house. Frozen as a statue, Chuck waited for several minutes, following the leisurely couple with widened eyes until they were finally out of sight. Only then did he take a breath, deciding not to tempt fate any longer. He quickly looked around and, seeing no one, rushed headlong to the sidewalk, jumped over the fence, and headed up the street. The damned mongrel from the neighboring area barked angrily after him. Trying his best to twitch less and attract attention to himself, the Pinkerton cousin walked around the block and returned to the car he had left. He was still breathing heavily from the rush of adrenaline when he slumped into the driver's seat. But at the same time, he was filled with boyish joy and pride at a successful task. Throwing the phone on the passenger seat, Chuck pulled out a tissue from his pocket with his shaking hands and hastily wiped the sweat from his forehead and neck. It's time to get out of here, he thought, after which he started the minivan and pulled out onto the road. Chuck was still driving towards his house when his cell phone rang. Hello? Tom's voice came through the earphone. Did you see anything? It was clear from his impatient tone that he had been waiting in suspense all morning for news. Sorry, brother. I almost got set on fire there, and I couldn't see anything, Chuck began apologetically. However, he added, I may have something on video from the room. What do you mean by saying possible? Tom began to fume. Did you get the video or not? Chuck briefly explained how his secret foray went and then said, I haven't watched the recording myself yet, and I don't know whether there's something there for us or not. I'm still driving towards home. Wait, don't come home. Tom suggested, burning with impatience. Come to my work, and we'll watch the video in my office. I'll call the front desk and let them know about you, and they'll take you upstairs. Fifteen minutes later, Chuck appeared and handed his brother a camera, and Tom connected it to his personal laptop. The video began with a shot of the side of a bed, then at the very top of the frame, human knees and shins periodically flashed, but nothing more. After a few moments, the camera moved slightly, and now only the lower side of the bed was visible. Tom literally groaned in disappointment and annoyance, slamming his hand on the table. This is completely useless. You can't see a damn thing here. However, just as he finished his frustrated tirade, the image suddenly shifted again, and two bodies flashed into the frame as the camera panned up, stopping at the sight of a ceiling fan above the bed. Stop! What was it? Can we go back and maybe freeze frame it? Tom exclaimed excitedly, reaching for the laptop's built-in keyboard. Wait, Chuck grabbed his hand. Just wait a second. The camera shook again and went down, moving from showing the ceiling to the bed, and then Tom exhaled the air from his lungs in shock, hissing in a deadened voice. The camera was focused on the couple having a night. Brad gripped the woman's hips tightly, and an expression of bliss walked across his face, glistening with sweat. After a few seconds, Amy jerking back and forth, turned her face, eyes half-lidded, directly towards the camera. Tom's old world collapsed in an instant and crumbled into a thousand pieces. He sat dumbly hunched over and staring with an empty, unseen gaze at the screen, where the cheating wife and her lover continued their wild copulation. His lower lip protruded and sank down like that of an undeservedly offended boy, his jaw trembled slightly, and tears welled up in his eyes. After pausing for a few minutes until the recording ended, Chuck sighed, turned off the camera, and disconnected it from the laptop. He pulled out the video memory card that was inserted into the laptop and handed it to Tom. I'm so sorry, cousin. I hoped until the end that I was wrong about. Here, not knowing what else to say, Chuck gently patted his cousin on the back, who continued to sit motionless. Chuck grabbed his things and left his office, carefully closing the door behind him. On the other side of town, Brad sat in his office, absent-mindedly staring out the window, talking on the phone. Yeah, dude, she said she decided to get out of our deal. She wants to surprise Tom. Well, she's sort of planning a trip to Hawaii with him and plans for him to knock her up while they're tumbling around there. Brad grimaced as if he had a toothache and kicked the leg of his desk in irritation. Yeah, 
I tried, buddy, but she's already made up her mind. I think she will tell you more about this herself next week when you see her. Yeah, well, go ahead and try to dissuade her yourself, okay, Tim? I got you. See you later, Brad barked irritably, hitting the table with his fist. Brad knew that over these months, he had become firmly hooked on regular intim with Amy. Not that it was some kind of love. No, rather a habit, very pleasant and requiring constant repetition. It didn't bother him at all that he had to pay for intimate with her. At least he could enjoy the availability of this hot young married woman's body. Moreover, he knew for sure that for a ridiculous 200 bucks, not a single professional woman of easy virtue would agree to give up her fifth place. And even without a rubber band, which he managed to quite easily persuade Amy to do so. This business of hers was a very profitable investment for Brad and his friends. Returning to Brad's house that morning, Marguerite, the housekeeper, began unpacking the bedding in the master bedroom. One would think that the owners would be embarrassed to leave the bed in such a blatant mess, but no, Marguerite got and laid down fresh sheets, made the bed, and moved on. She tossed the stained sheets into the washing machine, thinking they could be washed while she cleaned the rest of the house. As Tom sat at his desk in the office, his thoughts were running wild like cockroaches as he tried to make sense of what he saw on the video. He wanted to convince himself it wasn't true, but it wasn't. She wasn't under the influence of alcohol or pills. She was doing this with gusto and for money. As he sat and tried to figure out what to do next with all this, suddenly a terrifying thought pierced his brain like lightning. What if she has others? Brad warned me at that party that all my friends were hitting on Amy. What if Brad wasn't the only rat? Damn unbearable pictures of how Amy willingly exposes her fifth place to each of those who constantly hovered around her got into his head and began their round dance in an impotent rage. Tom again slammed his fist on the table so much so that the mug with half-drunk coffee jumped and toppled over on its side, pouring brown liquid all over his notes and business papers. Tom didn't care about it now, he wanted to scream, stamp his feet and crushed the jaws of her lovers who lied to his face and so skillfully pretended to be friends. When, after a few minutes, the veil of rage that had overwhelmed his mind fell from his eyes, Tom began to think more rationally. He realized that he needed to gather more evidence of his wife's infidelity. Damn, I'm going to need Chuck's help again. Over the next four weeks, Chuck, having settled into his role as an undercover detective, collected videotapes of Amy with Tim, Roland, and Frank. Already suspecting the worst, Tom was still completely crushed when he learned for certain that all the guys he once considered friends were happily having intim with his wife. The humiliation was deep and extremely painful. But somehow, incredibly, he managed to pretend both at home and at work that everything was fine. During these troubled days, every morning and evening, standing in front of the bathroom mirror and resting his hands on the sink, he looked at his reflection for a long time. You have to pretend that nothing happened and behave naturally, he constantly repeated to himself like a mantra, while he collected all the irrefutable evidence he needed. Tom arrived home at the usual time, and Amy, who met him, said that she was inviting her husband to dinner at his favorite steakhouse. He was wary but agreed to the evening out, managing to reliably put a feigned smile on his face. Inviting his wife was an infrequent event in their lives, and during dinner, Tom wondered why she had started all this. When they returned home, Amy sat her husband down on the sofa and laid out travel brochures about Hawaiian attractions in front of him. She excitedly explained how she spent a year saving and saving money from her earnings to pay for a future trip, beaming with the solemnity of the moment. Amy laid out to Tom all the details of how carefully she had thought through and prepared their trip and even paid for the tour in full in advance. Finally, she admitted that secretly from her husband, she called his boss and told him about the surprise so that Tom's upcoming vacation was already fully approved by his superiors. Tom was a little overwhelmed by all the news about the trip that his wife had thrown at him. They had talked about such a trip many times before, but its high cost forced them to put it on the back burner, at least until the family savings account was replenished to a very substantial amount. Now Amy's eyes sparkled with excitement, and she almost jumped for joy when she told her husband about her plans. Darling, everything is carefully timed for me here. Look, she began to bend her fingers. I'm going off birth control so that when we get to Hawaii, I'll be ovulating according to my cycle. We will make love twice a day, and I will return home already pregnant with our child. Really, it will be great. 
Isn't that the most romantic thing you've ever heard? Amy nearly clapped her hands, smiling widely, and at the same time, clearly proud of how wonderfully she had organized everything. Tom thought for a moment, mentally analyzing his own plans, and then clapping his hands, he turned to his wife, who was impatiently awaiting his answer. A wonderful surprise, my dear. I think your plan will work just fine for the two of us, Tom said, grinning. Amy squealed in delight and jumped into her husband's lap, pushing him onto the couch, holding him tightly in her arms. She kissed him and immediately slid to the floor, dragging him into the bedroom. I'm so glad, honey. Come on, let's quickly go and practice making babies, she said eagerly. Tom assumed that she was still safe to conceive at that point, and he also knew that it would be very strange for him to refuse her insistent offer of intim at such a moment. As usual, he had to keep things natural for the time being. So, Tom had a night with her twice before he allowed himself to drift off to sleep. Sally Hawk, the divorce lawyer Tom contacted, watched the videos he and Chuck had collected and listened to his request. So, you want her to be served with divorce papers at the airport and have these videos delivered to four wives at the same time that your wife's boyfriends are getting bogus lawsuits for alienation of affection? Sally asked, tapping her pen on the smooth, polished surface of the table. Exactly, Tom nodded in agreement. They will all gather at the airport for a big party to see Amy and me off on our trip. I arranged for a limousine to pick them up and take all four couples to the airport. In addition, we have already reserved tables in the waiting room, which will be served with a variety of drinks and snacks. Tom grinned with grim vindictiveness. My additional surprise is a large banner with the inscription farewell which will be deployed as soon as your attendant serves her with the court papers. These fake lawsuits are designed to shock everyone present, but at the same time, I want to add pepper to the carefree lives of these four. Sally raised her left hand in a warning gesture. Stop, stop, she interrupted Tom, who was beginning to boil again. You shouldn't swear in this office, Mr. Matson. although I, of course, understand your anger and emotions. The lawyer nodded at him with sympathy. No one has ever asked me to do this before, but I admit, what you have in mind must be a real show. She involuntarily grinned. When do you want our performer to appear at the airport? This must happen at the right moment, the very minuter flight to Hawaii is announced. So, the exact time when everything should happen is Saturday at 1300 hours. And then came the momentous day when all the deceivers and their unsuspecting spouses gathered in the airport lounge. All of the couple's luggage was pre-checked in for the flight, including some of Amy's additional personal items she put in a suitcase that she thought her husband would use while on vacation. Tom watched his watch carefully, glancing at it every now and then. A few moments before Sally's assistant was supposed to arrive with the papers, he stood up and called everyone to their attention who were cheerfully chattering and enjoying the delicacies of the guests. Dear Amy, he turned to his wife, dressed in a bright vacation dress and smiling happily, you have been the love of my life since we met almost nine years ago. When you started grooming, I was very proud of the efforts you made. You tried your best and literally busted my fifth place to turn your small, modest business into a profitable and prosperous enterprise. Tom saw that this ambiguous remark of his caused several malicious grins and cynical winks, which his wife's lovers furtively exchanged. The frozen Amy seemed to have a slightly alarmed look in her eyes at these words, although a wide smile still remained on her face. When you decided to spend all your profits on this wonderful vacation, I was very happy about it. Holding a glass of champagne in his hands, Tom bowed slightly in her direction. So, I have a small token of gratitude for each of you, and now, while my assistant is handing out gifts, let's all raise our glasses to Amy and wish her a bon voyage. Tom nodded slightly, and a large beautifully designed banner with this wish unfurled over the heads of those sitting around the table just as Amy received her. Envelope and heard Sally's assistant loudly and solemnly announce, summons served. Just a second ago, the lively table instantly fell into dead silence. Having managed to notice out of the corner of his eye how, at the sight of the divorce papers, her eyes widened and the smile fell from her instantly pale face. Tom turned to the four stunned wives and said in a contrite voice, Ladies, I humbly apologize for the perhaps theatricality of this event, and I wish you all the best. With these words, he put his still unfinished glass on the table, turned, and walked away just at the moment when the airport informant turned on and announced the start of boarding for Amy's flight. 
Behind him, chaos erupted as chairs crashed, glasses crashed, and everyone started yelling hysterically at each other. Tom heard Amy scream his name desperately and heartbreakingly, but he never looked back because I did everything my lawyer told me to do before the divorce. I didn't talk to Amy until our first meeting in Sally's office. The lawyers argued among themselves for a long time, and today we were going to meet to finally settle everything and put our signatures on the papers. Amy insisted that I agree to a 30-minute one-on-one meeting after all the formalities were completed. I just assumed she wanted a chance to explain why she did what she did that ruined our marriage. As part of her preparatory work before the trial, Sally hired a real private investigator to check Chuck's work. This guy got his money's worth by revealing the details of the financial arrangements my future ex-wife had made with her four fifth-place renters. It was a real shock for me to find out that she had been cheating on me for almost a year. But the full awareness of this fact helped kill any remaining feelings for Amy that were still simmering somewhere in the depths of my soul. Sally also subsequently told me that Amy never got on the plane to Hawaii that day. Her non-refundable tickets went unused, and her fully prepaid holiday was cancelled without any monetary compensation. When we all gathered at the negotiation table, Amy unsuccessfully tried to talk to me several times, but I ignored her until all the papers were signed. After the lawyer shook hands and left, we were left alone in the office. I sat down at the table opposite her and stared at her intently, encouraging her to start a conversation. Hmm. She began with difficulty in a quiet, hesitant voice. Thank you for agreeing to talk to me, Tom. I'm so sorry for the pain I caused you. Tears appeared in her shining eyes. But honey, I still don't understand why you divorced me. What I did meant absolutely nothing. It was just a business agreement, a commercial service, nothing more. You were the only man in my life that I love, and the only one I will ever love for real. Amy leaned forward across the table and tried to take my hands in hers. I sat back in my chair and silently crossed my arms over my chest, continuing to look coldly at my now ex-wife. Tears rolled down her cheeks, and the tone of her voice began to sound pitifully pleading. Tom, please, we've always had such a good time together. Please, baby, why can't we just leave this misunderstanding behind? It was just a stupid deal. I raised my hand to stop her. Amy, I believe you. When you decided to sell yourself to these guys, I know you didn't think much of it. To you, it was the same as if you agreed to let them, I don't know, wash your feet or give you a pedicure, right? She nodded so hastily and furiously, like a Chinese dummy, that I chuckled internally. As if you wouldn't tear her head off. It was an intimate act. Oh, sorry, correction, a lot of acts that didn't really mean anything to anyone. Did I understand everything correctly? Her face drenched in tears with running mascara and smeared lipstick instantly brightened and lit up happily. Yes. Oh my god, honey, you finally understood. All this meant nothing to me. I raised my hand again, this time interrupting her wild joy. Yes, Amy, it took me a while to figure it out, but now I fully understand that everything you did was just a business deal that meant absolutely nothing to you. Now, I raised my voice pronouncing the words clearly, but the small nuance in this whole business, Amy, is that it meant a lot to me. Let me ask you, Amy, when you made an agreement with them to sell yourself to them, did you really think that I would agree to your deal? She lowered her head, biting her lips and fumbling with the napkin in her white-knuckled hands. Well, that's the problem. Maybe for you, it didn't mean anything, but you knew for sure that for me, this would mean everything. But you did it anyway. I stood up, took two tattered $100 bills from my back pocket and threw them on the table in front of Amy. Thank you for giving me your time today. Keep your usual fee. She didn't say anything, just shuddered with her whole body as if from a slap in the face and closed her eyes. Her lips trembled and transparent tears continued to stream from under her clenched eyelashes. The past was over. I turned and left, accompanied by the quiet sobs of a woman who was now a stranger to me. What do you think of today's story? I like that there were plenty of plot twists and twists and twists. Write your opinion about the story in the comments. See you in the next video.